So the title, In a World Awash with Personal Data, and that's what has driven my research in particular, how can we empower people to harness and control their data? Very much what I have as, that's been a driver for my research for decades and my vision for the medium term. So there's a list of, a bit of an overview, five things, so you can count them off as we go through. The goals of my work, then an overview and an introduction to this word scrutability. Uh, there'll be a test on this afterwards. Um, it's not a common word in English, so that's why I wanted to foreshadow it first. A few case studies from work we've done. And then introducing a term that I wish were more widely used. It comes from um, the artificial intelligence in education community called Open Learner Models. And I'm going to introduce how that works and uh, where I see that fitting into things. And then the fifth thing, which I hope you'll also comment on, is the way that I have taken some of these ideas and used them in my teaching in a course called Human in the Loop Data Analytics in a method called sort of something like constructive alignment and uh, take questions on that. So firstly, the driving goals of my work. Um, on the left, you've got the technologies and methods uh, Ubicomp, ubiquitous computing that is, very techo, we build systems in our group and you know hardware, software, networks, machine learning, um, all sorts of things. And then very much though my own focus is human computer interaction and information visualization more recently from the human perspective. Well they're the technologies but I, I really have the weight down on the problems that I really want to address and they are what really drives my work. And I really want to uh, move away from this notion that you know we all have our little hammers and we go and look for nails. Um, well, I, I suppose we want to start with real problems and try and solve them. So scrutability, and here's an overview of systems and interfaces designed so people can harness and control their data. Here's a bunch of the people involved and uh, again, hitting you with the words scrutability and user models. So first of all, I want to focus on the multiple meanings of user models, because depending where you come from, you'll be using the word and different people in the room will have different meanings. So um, there are three common uses. One is a user model is something in a person's head. So someone who's a designer in HCI has a model of the user, that's a user model. So to some people that's what we're talking about. Uh, nothing to do with um, in silico or anything, it's in someone's head. Um, okay, the next is an implicit model of the user frozen in the software. I mean, at the simplest level, in a sense, my slides are something I designed and um, I'm using words that are pitched at the fact that I have a model of my audience and words you'll understand, and that is frozen in what you see here. But of course, interfaces are more complex. But probably more interesting to your group is a machine representation of an individual. That's for, say, a recommender system, which builds a model of an individual and then recommends stuff to them. And we've done a lot of work on that, which I didn't bring today. But the other thing that probably your group would be even more interested in is a machine representation of many users. These are very different things um, from my perspective. And we've got to remember that the bottom two are in a machine and, and we have all these different meanings. So just about this word scrutable and um, often it's easier to look at synonyms and here's an English definition. So it means a person can understand a system if they scrutinize it, where that means examine very carefully. So I know that DARE is interested in these broad areas and lots of people talk about explainable AI and so on, but you know, really um, complex things are going to be complex to understand. We have to be aware that when we build interfaces for people to understand them, um, we're going to have to expect them to put some effort in and we're going to have to help them. So here's an example of something that's inscrutable, um, which Google uh, delivered. It said this mail is important because of our magic sauce. Nah, nah, we're not telling you why. Um, sometimes they don't do this, but I've seen it again recently. Now, people are inscrutable. That's no excuse for a machine to be. Um, we can't know what's in another person's mind. Um, 
in fact we may not even understand ourselves very well so we've got to be very careful of assuming that machines that we're going to build are just like people and in fact there is some very influential work that i'm very fond of by jonathan Haidt about um, that our conscious mind is like this little rider who thinks they're controlling the elephant but uh, you know elephants are big and go the way they want to and that's your subconscious mind um, all very important also for building interfaces I believe machines should not be inscrutable. Sorry for the double negative in HCI, we say we should not do that. But programmers and whoever builds the system, builds them, they should aspire to make them deterministic. I know that's a big ask in software that's complex. Uh, put a priority on design for scrutability and we don't know how to do that. So um, what are the benchmark tasks you would ask a person to do? You'd say, tell me if you can do this and a system is scrutable if they can say, what does this system model about me? You know, what is it keeping in its user model? Um, what does this system uh, have as data about me? Much simpler question, usually can't be answered. Um, where does the data come from that it's got? Did it bother keeping the provenance? Uh, where's the raw data? Where's the inferred data? very rarely keep even these really simple things but let's be very clear for a person to understand even simple stuff like this would require effort now how was the data used getting really complex now how did that recommendation get done um, and uh, how was the data interpreted to do it i did a lot of work with online dating with a company i can't name million users over 10 years lots of data very cool machine learning models uh, very messy uh, and I would have never been able to build anything to explain how the recommender worked. Also very important, of course, where does my data go? Is it sent off somewhere else? And there's a recent paper that Bob Kummerfeld and I wrote about the idea of uh, thinking about these things in an educational context. But above all, scrutability is a starting point for control. How can you easily say that you understand and control your data if you don't understand it first? Um, so why does it matter? And um, here's a sort of a, a mental model I want you to build. Here's a user's actual mind, you know, in someone's head and, you know, their private knowledge beliefs. And as I said, they may not understand themselves very well. Over here is the thing we want to build often, a user model of the individual between them. <laughs> Uh, is a very solid barrier. On one side, um, the machine model, on the other side, the human being's mind. So let's draw a dotted line uh, with the aspects the user has shared, you know, things they've typed at an interface, or maybe we've got cameras that are scanning their faces or whatever. They might be wearing devices uh, like this one, um, which is keeping all sorts of interesting data or uh, whatever. Um, then, of course, there are things the machine shares with the user and um, it's pretty important for the user model to keep track of that because it doesn't want to keep reacting the same way over and over it needs to know has to have memory of how it's treated the user so that it can then interpret the user's actions uh, this is really inspired by lucy sushman's really um, plans and situated action so keeping that in model um, if we're going to have a system for people to do lifelong, lifelong, life-wide learning, we're going to take data and help them. I think it's even more important than the stuff that DARE might have focused on in things like a recommender system. Um, but I think philosophically, the machine should be a servant to the user. We should have a clear definition of the relationship and it's asymmetric. And um, user or learner has a right to see the personal information this is a learning context programmers should be accountable especially in a learning context why are you treating this person as if they don't know things um, the user should be able to judge the correctness acceptability important if they're going to trust a system often um, if they might share it uh, or share information with it and uh, we know that AI has limitations. In fact, I've often thought we shouldn't have artificial intelligence. We should call it ass, artificial stupidity, because most of our systems at the moment are based on brute force and ignorance and fairly dumb algorithms that don't have a lot of insight, but they are artificial and they are um, in many cases quite stupid. And in a learning context, feel free to discuss this more, that 
it's particularly important to support metacognitive processes, um, which means helping people think about reflection, planning, and um, self-monitoring their progress. Very important. Oh, there they're listed. And these are foundation skills for self-regulated learning, which we know is very important. And as already mentioned, a foundation for control. So what this slide is about is all the reasons, and I'm sure that DARE will have many others, but all the reasons that you would want a system to be what I call scrutable, but even more important in an educational setting. And here's also, um, I chose scrutable over lots of other terms because you can see I've got on this display, and I'm happy to take your views on it, um, high user efforts at the top and low user effort is at the bottom. And this notion of transparent systems implies it's effortless. I can look out that window and barely aware that I'm looking through a window, even though it is a bit dirty. Um, scrutability really captures there's user effort. And then on the left side is this notion of something user-centered versus machine-centered. And I actually think a lot of the explainable AI is just that. The machine explains, but no one really does the hard yakka to work out whether the user has understood and what they've understood. And that's a pretty brutal assessment because I do know there has been a shift in that. But there's no way you can test whether explainability has achieved any of the things on the left unless you do user studies. Okay, so how can it work? And um, this was, oh, there are a couple of keynotes I've given in the top paper, happy to share the slides, is a paper where we summarized a whole lot of research. So what is there? There's raw data. Some of the questions are about that. Very important. Um, then there's the cleaning, wrangling, munging. As you know, that's a large part of what we do in managing data. And do we keep track of anything to explain to people how you got from the raw to whatever came next? And then we build inferred data in all sorts of methods. And frankly, the computer science community puts a lot of effort there rather than any of the layers above, which is a shame because I think the earlier ones are low hanging fruit comparatively. But eventually we want a long term user model. Here I'm talking about an individual user model potentially many ways to interpret the same collection of information about a person for different contexts. Depending what I am doing when I'm interacting with a person, I will interpret their knowledge differently and so should a system. And finally, we can build personalization processes. So what I have tried to do is build what I call a scrutiny and control layer and then very quickly, it's onto these bits, all these bits here. Uh, very quickly, what does that need? It needs interfaces onto the data, interfaces onto all the transformation of it. Now we're starting to get onto um, the ontology of the user model. In other words, the representation, the methods used to interpret the data and um, infrastructures then. This is now getting to systems, database and all that sort of thing. Um, then multiple interpretations and letting a user see it and finally support for people to do all of this. So really there are so many parts to scrutinize and huge challenges in interface design. That's what I want to tackle. Um, I know that there are there's certainly a lot of cool stuff to be worried about from the pure machine learning side, but this is the work that I do. So here are some case studies. Um, and here's one where someone you might recognize is wearing a smartwatch. And we wanted to harness just that sort of data and Li Ming Tang is on the left. He was the PhD student who did a lot of this work. And um, these are two of the papers that were involved. I'm going to play the video of his system. So this was an interface that took physical activity data, and I'm not showing you any human beings data. This was fake data from our tutorial. Um, so we assume people have weeks of data. The users in our study, some had several years. So this user has currently got a goal of 10,000 steps and you can mouse uh, the dark blue spots are when they made their target and you can mouse over any time. Uh, they've set it up so that they get light blue if they've ha reached half their goal. And so you can see that it's working correctly and you can scrutinize it. Um, very simple user model. White means they didn't even make 50%, but they did have some data. Whereas gray 
is when they had no data at all. And that's pretty important. And to our amazement, most of the data we've seen on analyzing activity data has ignored this. But anyway, here we go. Um, this person can, of course, change the goals and uh, apply that. And of course, the interface changes. They can also change this one. So now they're going to make a tighter, narrower band. And again, you can see there's a lot less light blue. I'm going to skip over the rest of that um, because oh, I'm going to hope the system lets me. So this was the interface. We had A is the steps, B is the stuff I showed you of the color. C is where there was no data. D was where we showed something to users they didn't care about <laughs> in our user studies, which is how much time they wore their device each day on average. Um, as I said, the users didn't care about it, but they should have, because if you don't wear the device, we don't know how much you've walked. Um, and again, most people ignore that when they do, even some nature papers have ignored it. Um, so we also then built a scaffolding and with questions like, um, look at your goal, it's 10,000 steps, just reminding you, um, should you change it? Um, how am I doing on weekends? Now this, as I said, was a fake user and you'll see if you look at Saturday at the top, uh, sorry, sound Sunday at the top and Saturday at the bottom, um, they're always white on this graph because in fact, public health researchers know that most people are less active on weekends. This is a takeaway for all of you and a warning in case you don't know. Um, and um, yet most people don't know it. And our user studies showed that even for people who were assiduous trackers. Um, so this is just one example of an interface and it aims to make data from a device like this available. Uh, one of the insights was that if there's nowhere, there's no data. That's not very deep. But as I said, it's been ignored. So we did a study where we drew together um, Li Ming Tang is the PhD student I mentioned before. Jochen Meyer and Daniel Epstein have done a lot of work in this area. Uh, Jochen is from Germany and Daniel from the US. And uh, the red people here are all public health researchers who joined us. And we uh, wanted to be systematic about knowing how to deal with this. So, um, you know, we have a driving question. You want to know how many steps do I walk each day? I mean, really, we ought to be able to work that out from the data. And we know that if you wore the device for 24 hours a day, they do work pretty well and um, it would be perfect. But our notion was that your adherence is a measure of how close you are to using the device in a way that makes it perfect, which of course most people can't for a lot of reasons. So we looked at 12 data sets and we got clinically significant differences between um, the answer to this question, depending on how you interpreted the missing data. And this is showing you the median steps. I'm going to zoom in. Um, here was one of our databases, data sets where each of these colors is our different ways of calculate dealing with this missing data. And you can see they're all together. Um, that was people who volunteered their data and are very keen. These are Sydney University students. Uh, these are actually IT students. And uh, they were much less good at wearing their device consistently. And you can see quite different, big differences, you know, down near 6,500 6 up to 9,000, uh, depending on how you dealt with missing data. Seems incredibly simple, but it hadn't been done. So um, we then took that idea and looked at how we could analyze some data from 140,000 people in Singapore in a public health initiative. And this is the paper. It's um, pretty cool. So this is an example of a person's data. You can see the blue bars, uh, how many steps they walked. And what was cool is we applied these ideas. I actually didn't think this would be helpful, but we um, did a pre-processing that took account of different ways to classify the raw data into so-called streaks, which is periods of wearing and breaks. Um, so a streak is a period that ends when you stop wearing it. Um, and also there were prizes for doing things which came into it. Anyway, we did cool clustering. Uh, the paper describes it in detail and we got some interesting clusters that came out. You can see this person uh, at the top did a burst of work and then 
really nothing and then a couple more bursts so they they were ex an example of what was called the the um, slow starter and lapsing user and here in the middle is what we call the intermittent user and on the bottom was what we've called the self-driven power user now the important thing was we could use this for all sorts of interesting public health questions and do some cool machine learning, which I won't go into because it's in the paper. Um, I want to now move quickly so that I can have time for discussion into this idea four out of five, if you're keeping track. Um, formal education and this open learner models, which I mentioned at the beginning, hopefully to um, make sure I could prime you. So here is a system that was built a very long time ago and is still running. It's called Elmart. It's a seminal system by a psychologist in Germany, Gerhard Weber, and he wanted to teach psych students LISP. And so he has these six lessons. And um, if you start using, this is in the top left of the interface. And after you've done a little bit of the first lesson, it expands and shows you how you're progressing. You see this person, which was actually me, has mastered atoms, um, but all the red bits they haven't done. And um, this is what we call an open learner model because it's showing you the data the system's kept about your progress in a way that tells you whether you've learned things or not. And this is again a bit later. And this is called a traffic light metaphor because it um, color codes things green as being you're ready to do things and red you're not. So you should do the green things first. Here's another one which I quite like um, in the context of a, um, a first year course learning Java. And Brusilovsky at Pittsburgh has a whole lot of really interesting work. Here he's got a whole lot of concepts in Java. The green is an individual's progress and um, the blue is the comparable thing for the whole group. Uh, my education colleagues don't like social comparison, but students do and humans do. Um, if you click as the user has where this diamond is, you find out how that, uh, that particular cell got the color it did. If it were really um, super scrutable, you'd then click down to the quizzes and be able to fix it, go and do more. Um, another example that I really like, um, Vincent Eleven from Carnegie Mellon, who um, has built a lot of things in this area. This is where he's teaching, he's built a teaching system, Lynette, for um, kids to learn arithmetic. And um, this one, though, showed that if you ask a person to rate their knowledge before you show them this open learner model on the right, they learn more, which is kind of cool. Um, so. This influenced work we did in um, what was really quite a mad and ambitious study at Sydney Uni. This is a room that had five tabletops and the students did work for a whole semester for their pracs at these tabletops. You can see in the foreground these concept maps uh, that the students are working on together. In the middle is the tutor. On the left is all the PhD students who made all this work. There was a back end that connected it to a GitHub-like system so that things were, um, each week they came back to them and they could work on them in between. And they could do various collaborative activities in the class. Now, importantly, you'll see the tutor in the middle is holding a tablet, which looks, um, there were a number of them, but this particular one is showing each table when four tabletops were enabled. On the left is stuff to control the classroom. But on the right is showing how the students are going on the task they're meant to be doing. And so if we look at the blue table, the dark blue is when the students have done um, work in their interface that the system can recognize as correct. The light blue is when the system can recognize they've done stuff, but it isn't smart enough to tell whether it's right or not. Um, and each individual is a separate bar, so you can get an idea of what's going on. We built a whole lot of interfaces, um, including doing experiments to see what we needed to do to enable teachers to use this, you know, under the pressure of being in a classroom. Lots of cool stuff. So um, this is learning in the wild and um, next step. We did this, we've still got this, um, the dregs of this system on the side of our building. And um, we had a system we wanted people to be able to walk up and learn the gestures to use this large display. So here is a user using, you swipe your hand to the right and it moves across, you put your arm up and it goes up 
and then you can go across some more and so on and I'm going to skip on. So essentially there was a hierarchy of information for people to explore and they had to walk out, work out that it was interactive and learn how to use it. So what did we do? Um, we built an open learner model and in fact what happened is this was sort of on-screen documentation but as you did each gesture it changed color and so you could see your progress and that was extremely effective we also did interviews and people talked about it um, we also discovered people doing silly things and playing and um, we did things like study whether people playing managed to learn how to use the interface um, and whether they fooled the modeling and um, in fact oh well cool the plane didn't really interfere with the learning so there were a whole lot of insights about how to build these interfaces for real life people walking up needing to be able to learn really quickly so the last example that i want to introduce is how i've taken these ideas into my teaching last year and we'll be doing so this year but i want to show it to you in the constant context of a learning um, data analytics course so it should be interesting to you since you're data analytics people uh, this is a 3000 level course and the students have done at least four semesters of data science subjects and um, this is part of my vision to help people see understand and make sense so what this picture is showing you is that um, the current world is really good at helping you answer things if you um, believe you want to know it uh, sorry if I believe I know things uh, I'm in great sh shape um, even better if the students come into my class wanting to learn something and then learning it and also so needing is wanting and uh, then believing they know it here's a situation where um, I know I want to know something but I at the moment don't know it now we can do Google searches if we know we want to find something. Um, however, um, much harder is when I don't feel the need to know something, um, but I believe I know it and it may or may not be correct. And even worse is the one in the lower left where I don't know I want to know it and um, I need help to find out that I need to know it because I'm not going to search for it. So that was rather long winded and I have a feeling it will make more sense when I show you the picture. So I'll skip over this. This is um, an open learner model ontology. So this is the stuff in my course as it was last year in the form that I shared with the students. So you'll see that um, this is actually a spreadsheet that I shared with them and you can see there are 160 rows. Uh, many of them are compacted. So what I'm going to do is show you what happens if you click on row 24. It shows you uh, the conceptual models that were involved in the course. And here, probably more interesting to you, is the sorts of ethics topics the students were expected to learn. What's interesting here is some of them are attitudes and some of them are knowledge. So um, I'll just skip over that. There is a version of this which if you want to we, I can share it with you. Um, I will actually put it in the chat. I um, did, I love the way this interface moves things around. Where's the chat? Oh there it is. Um, so um, you can play with that and I will in a minute. But um, the idea is that students knew what was in the course and in the teaching um, I asked students to track their own learning and in the exam I asked them to submit their um, use it for revision and to submit it and in the classes we used it throughout as a way to create common vocabulary and um, to show students how everything they did related to it with um, considerable detail. Now the next three steps, uh, next two steps, sorry, are to design learning data and um, something like SRES to turn it into an interface. And uh, But in lectures, um, I regularly set um, questions asking students what they knew and what they wanted to know. 
which is why I had that rather complex diagram that I didn't explain very well. Um, and hopefully they were able to then slot that into their model and track where the course was going because the course has lots of connections across it and I thought this was going to be helpful for them. In the student evaluations they seemed to volunteer that it was. Um, I also gave them quizzes that enabled them to see in the lectures how they had done on content that they just um, heard about. And um, there's a bottom here. If we want to actually build an interface, we're going to make some hard need to make some hard decisions on how to use it. But at the moment, human beings can actually do it quite nicely. Very quickly, there are a whole lot of people who've contributed to our work. So the infrastructure stuff, uh, Ubicomp interfaces, um, people now working in my lab, students on lifelong, life-wide learning, people who've worked on more education. But now I'd like to hear your insights and take your questions um, because uh, understanding and knowing is uh, collaborative. And just as a revision, here are the five topics that I put up at the beginning. And uh, I'm hoping there's still time for plenty of discussion.